Welcome to my podcast, Why Didn't Anyone Tell Me This? With my guests, we are discussing health issues, questions you may have about your health, and debunking some of the many myths around our health. And today, it is a great pleasure to talk to Athena Lamnissos about making the five, yes, five, gynecological cancers more visible. Now, Athena is CEO of the leading women's health charity, The Eve Appeal, which is focused on education about the five gynecological cancers and their prevention. Athena is experienced at forging partnerships between private, public and not-for-profit sectors. She has a track record of directing successful change programmes in the arena of public health and oncology and is passionate about making the public's voices heard. Her career spans working for Friends of the Earth, where she led the communications and fundraising doctorate, through to a leading public sector campaigns as a founding board, mem- board, board director of Forsters. She has held numerous trustee roles, including a food waste charity, Fair Share, and as a founding trustee of restorative justice charity, The Forgiveness Project. Wow. Welcome, Athena. Hello. So it's a, it's a good real to pleasure. see you from sunny Cyprus. Yes, I was going to say you're in sunny Cyprus. I'm in sunny, you know, near Cambridge. <laughs> We've got the sun with us today. <laughs> so I, I always start by asking all my guests to tell us what led them to their current career trajectory. Yeah. So, well, you've kind of gone through my career, which broadly falls into kind of three chunks, really. So I was at Friends of the Earth. I'm a stayer. I'm a stayer in in roles. So I was at Friends of the Earth for a very long time. And I went in through the um, information route. And I suppose by background, I'm a communications, a strategic communications, brand communications um, person. So uh, when I left Friends of the Earth, I was director of comms and um, fundraising. And that was my kind of professional specialism. Uh, When I was at Friends of the Earth, I did a lot of partnership work with the body shop, the body shop and the fantastic Anita Roddick. Um, And... Doing that kind of partnership work between the voluntary sector and the corporate sector and kind of business for good, doing business for good became really interesting to me. I really liked those kinds of partnerships that could bring issues and awareness in different ways to a wider populace. And Anita was so fantastic about that. And the body shop was such a magical kind of partner in in that way to talk about acid rain, the ozone layer, rainforest destruction. It was incredible. Um, And then when I left Friends of the... I've had a lot of children. That's the other thing you need to know. I've got four children. So kind of, uh, you know, thinking about that, I was head of department. I was leading a very big department. I was pretty young and I was pregnant for the uh, second time. And I just thought, I don't think I can come back and do this full time leading a department after having another baby. So I thought, oh, I'll go into consultancy and someone who had headed up communications at the body shop. So the board director of comms at the body shop was just leaving the body shop to uh, had gone to market by that stage. And um, she wanted to set up a communications consultancy that only worked on issues, but across all three sectors. So I thought, oh, I'll do a few days a week there when I had my second child. Um, And of course, I joined and was, uh, you know, joined the the, the board within no time and was full time in no time. And that's where I stayed for 16 years. And at Forster, we did something really quite different, which was um, worked with all three sectors. So corporate, voluntary and a lot with the government, um, so public sector. on a range of issues and that's where I built up the health practice. So I started doing a lot of work around public health on a range of really cheerful issues, everything from flu flu immunisation to sexual health to teenage pregnancy to substance misuse. I worked on on Frank, the drug uh, misuse campaign um, and a whole set of communications, alcohol misuse, everything that you could think of. And I became really interested in health um, 
prevention and what motivates people to look after their health. I also did a couple of projects which were real moments of truth for me there. So one was working in Tower Hamlets uh, on their breast screening program, which was woeful um, in terms of getting two audiences to, do, to undertake breast screening. One was the kind of C2DE white audiences who had lived in Tower Hamlets all their lives, um, who just weren't going for screening. The other was uh, the Bangladeshi community of women who were not attending screening in the numbers that they should. And I really, it was really interesting looking with those audiences, taking a real co-production -pro co approach from the beginning to look at what their different bar barriers were, which were actually entirely different for each audience, and really looking at their barriers, really understanding that one group of them, the, the, the kind of the, the, the white audience, really didn't want to be talked to about cancer. They thought if you talk to someone about cancer, you got cancer. They didn't want to talk about going for screening because they thought if you found cancer, you were going to be mutilated from the beginning. And then talking to the Bangladeshi audience who had totally different barriers, they really didn't want to get a letter which talked about breasts through the post um, from someone who they didn't know or trust. They had huge problems with actually physically getting to screening. So transport was a huge issue for them. They they really knew, like the back of their hands, various places in the community. But one place they certainly didn't know was where to attend um, for a mammography. And they just had very different barriers, very different trusted communications, very different language that they wanted to, to use. So that was a real moment of truth. And that was probably now at least 15 years ago, which is why I slightly despair when people talk about hard to reach audiences, because it's really not that hard. You need to go and speak to them and understand where they are and what their barriers and challenges are and how you can overcome them. The other project I did was with the Human Fertilization and Embryology Association. So the, the people who, you know, do all of the work around IVF, etc. And a really, um, really interesting uh, piece of work and research had been done over a very long time, which was looking at mitochondrial disease and how to how how mitochondrial disease could be eradicated. So very science heavy program um, that that basically resulted in you can eradicate mitochondrial disease by uh, by using three parents to produce your IVF. Um, your IBF fertilized embryo. And they knew that very careful stakeholder communications was needed so that the media didn't go wild and talk about three person Frankenstein's babies, that the, the poor parents who wanted to have children that weren't affected by mitochondrial disease were considered and that everyone kind of came behind that as a scientific discovery. And that, that piece of kind of how to engage a broad set of stakeholders, including the public and media, around a scientific and research-based issue really interested me. So the kind of health, gender health and equalities research all came together and I decided to look long and hard for a charity that I could really get behind. And that's where the Eve Appeal came into play. So uh, what was really interesting about E for me was that it was a gynecological health is an issue that needs communication. So that's my professional background, making the complex more accessible. Um, it brought in gender equalities big time. And it also, it seemed to me even then, and it really depresses to me to say it's got worse, equalities and hard, you know, these kind of vulnerable, hard to reach audiences have become less equal over the last decade than rather than more equal. And it was an organisation that stood behind the power of investing in research. And that was really, really important to me. The other thing that really appealed was, I don't think uh, the UK invests in health prevention and nothing is going to save lives like investing in health and keeping ourselves healthy. And that's Eve Appeal's sweet spot. We don't do treatment. We're not like all these other cancer charities that are there to hold your hands from the point of diagnosis to 
fun palliative care. We've got fantastic charities that do that, either you know, the juggernauts like Macmillan or onto the wonderful the palliative care and hospice movement. No one focuses on speaking to everyone about why they need to stay well. And that investment in health prevention was really, really important to me, having worked for so long with the Department of Health on a whole range of health campaigns. I was just like screaming out to say, please stop trying to fix people when they're broken. Please let's talk to people when they're healthy about how to keep themselves healthy. Wow, Athena, the, you, you've done so much more than I even realised. Anne had four children. You, you really are Wonder Woman. That, that, is, that is absolutely amazing. How, how old are your children now? I don't think so. <laughs> the, youngest is twen- the youngest is 23 and the oldest wow. is uh, 30. And I'm in Cyprus because my parents have moved. I was born in England, but my parents have moved back to Cyprus. And they're now very elderly. And my 93-year-old father asked me why I'd come away for so long to see him I've only come for 10 days to to be here um, and to kind of be around them for a while because they need some help Uh, and he asked me where the baby was and I was like "Uh, the baby's gone to work she's 23 (laughs) oh wow (laughs) how did I leave the baby for so long (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh bless him your family must be so proud of you that and and you've done so much yeah. to help so many different populations of people i mean my hat absolutely goes off to you what what a glittering and amazing career um and, and today we're going to talk more about the the work of the eva pill and the gynecological cancers and i i wanted to just stress to people i, I think not everyone knows what gynecological cancers are so there we're talking today about womb ovarian, cervical, vulval, and vaginal. But before we go into that, so you, you've mentioned about the Eve Appeal and mm. that you're different than the other cancer charities. Mm. So tell us more about yeah. the work of the Eve Appeal. Yeah, yeah, of course. So Eve really is quite different. So we work across the five gynecological cancers, which is pretty unique. You've got um, ovarian specific charities I mean I used to say you have a cervical specific charity but, but unfortunately Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust has very really sadly um, just closed it closed last week and you know working in charities in the UK is a real has been a real struggle in the last five years we don't get government funding we don't sell services a lot of us you know it's a real struggle to keep raising those funds and keep going Um, So we work across the five gynecological cancers. We are prevention focused. So we are focused on early diagnosis, prevention and finding these cancers at the earliest opportunity or stopping them before they start. We've got a really fiercely um, specific strategy. We're really clear about what we do and what we don't do. And we do three things. We fund medical research and prevention, new screening programs, early detection. And, well, we can come on to it. But, you know, that is just so underfunded um, as an area of research. Cancer research needs more funding. Gynecological cancers need more funding. Prevention and early diagnosis is a real hole in terms of funding. So we fund medical research. That's one thing we do. The second thing that we do is we run education programs, awareness campaigns, um, advocacy programs, produce a lot of information. We are PIFTIC accredited, which is the trusted information um, standard in the UK. That's really important that people know they're coming to trusted sources of information. We put a lot of that out on social media. You know, you will know women's health information across social media is really patchy in terms of quality and evidence base. Really difficult area, really difficult area, really important. The charities like Eve exist to tell you exactly what the evidence is and not try and sell you something in a feminine hygiene bottle um, and you know just talk a lot of uh, talk a lot of nonsense quite often around what is good for your health and what you need to be aware of and what you need to be scared of actually we are kind of you know there's huge industry out there selling women fear in various bottles and patches and potions Um, And then the third thing we do, and the only direct service we we run, is very unique. It's called Ask Eve. It's a nurse-led information service. So we're we're the only charity that um, employs gynae specialist nurses. 
that service is free to use. It's for any question that you have about signs, symptoms, risk factors, when you're waiting for diagnostic tests, when you want to know whether you need to go to the doctor because you've got a strange discharge or your periods have changed or you've got bloating or whatever the symptoms might be. A lot of questions around genetic risk, a lot of questions around Lynch syndrome and BRCA, which put you at high, you know, they're both genetic mutations that put you at high risk of um, developing uh, two of the gynecological cancers. Um, a lot of questions when people find out their HPV status. So people go for cervical screening. They really don't understand that letter that then, then, then comes through to them and tells them that they've got HPV um, and what the steps are, you know, to colposcopy and through the, through the various stages from there. Um, so that, that's what the Eve Appeal does. It's here for anyone who wants to support the gynecological cancers and it's really here for you if you want to invest in why people in the future shouldn't get one of those cancers. Wow, that, that, that it really is amazing work. And, and I'm at the Institute for Women's Health and the Eve Appeal have sponsored many of the research projects in our institute on on these gynecological cancers yeah. and you 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 also yeah. said about the um the way what we're selling women you know i'm having discussions this week with my students about all this new health tech which is you know marketed so well to women but please if there are any questions yeah. about gynecological cancers they need to go to the eve appeal yeah. website for reliable evidence-based yeah. information so that yeah. that's absolutely paramount yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I love hearing about history, and I, when I was preparing yeah. to interview you, I had a look at your Eve Appeal. And you've got a, a lovely history of how the Eve Appeal was established. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So we were established, like I suppose a lot of health charities, probably we were established by um, a uh, clinician who had a real vision about. Um, you know, the lack of investment in prevention, particularly of ovarian cancer. And then a couple where the uh, fairly young woman, she was in her early 30s, was um, going through surgery and treatment for ovarian cancer. And that couple decided to fundraise for their, you know, inspiring clinician. So that was Ian Jacobs. And that was, you know, back in the day. And what Ian did was was something really smart, which was think very carefully about having a flagship research study that could really, you know, pave the way. And so UK CTOX, as it was known, which was the probably the biggest um, screening study actually on any medical research issue that has ever happened around ovarian screening, popula whole population screening. Um, Possibly a study like that wouldn't happen now. I don't know who would fund it, to be honest, Joyce. You know, it's a, it's a very different world. And we funded that study um, to collect the early samples to prove that there was, you know, something to look at, there some efficacy. And then we did something which we've done repeatedly since then, which is we've then brought in bigger research funding. So Eve Appeal, this tiny little charity, funded the initial collection of samples did the initial research and then bigger research funders, so the Medical Research Councils, the Departments of Health in England, Scotland and Wales, Cancer Research UK all came into play. And that ended up as a 30 million research programme, which went on for seven years and, and unfortunately didn't prove the case, which was, you know, sometimes with research, it's almost as useful to not prove the case for something as to prove the case for it. I know that it's very disappointing on some levels. It proved all sorts of things, it has been a huge benefit, huge benefit, that study, um, including for, for at-risk population groups. But as a whole population approach, it hasn't resulted in a screening programme for ovarian cancer. But that model of working has become part and parcel of how we've worked. So we've done that numerous times. We, leading on from that study, funded something called um, GCATS, which was looking at high risk populations at ovarian um, cancer development. So that was looking at BRCA and taking a population based approach. So 
we took the, the Jewish population, that study proved six years ago that it would save both lives and money in terms of treatment to implement um, screening, BRCA screening, in the whole Jewish population, not just people who were who had a family history of BRCA. And fantastically, that has been now rolled out in the last year in the NHS. These things take time. And again, funding came in from elsewhere to really, you know, realise that ambition. It's been brilliant. And we've done that with... Um, with with another program called 4C, which is looking at four pro, four different kinds of um, uh, uh, cancers, um, and where EU funding has come into play, it's been a great way of working. And just last year, we funded a research fellowship, which we've done in partnership with another charity um, who are based in, in the north of England, and we pointed out to them that. In their entire region, they had really growing numbers affected by womb cancer. And the womb cancer fellow that we were funding could be a great investment for them. So we're always looking at ways to kind of make research funding go further. And that's very much born out of the history of how we started and how we've developed. The other thing that's developed along the way is that we have become an AMRC charity. So all of our research funding from now um, goes out by open call. That's very important to us. And that's something that donors often aren't aware of when they're thinking about who they're going to support. You know, there are lots of great hospital associated charities, for example, really important to, to, to support them. But they are giving funding to either that academic institution or that hospital. And that's a great thing to do. You're investing in a team that you know and that your team that you trust. Um, but also there's a lot to be said for going out to open call and fishing in the widest pool you possibly can when it comes to medical research. Wow, what, what a track record. And um, even though the, like with the UK CTOX, it was not what, what we all had hoped for. As you said, there was important information along the way. So before we go and talk about each of the cancers in a bit more detail, I know that the Eva Pill has been very passionate about women understanding their anatomy. So your education part is so important. And yeah. I've been to an event you organised yeah. quite a few years ago where we talked a lot about yeah. getting those words right, using vulva. How can, how can you know you've got vulval cancer if you yeah. don't know what your vulva is? So tell us about um, yeah. the Eva Pill's work on language. Yeah. Look, if you're focused on prevention and early diagnosis, as we are, you've got to take things back many, many stages. And that start, starts with sex and health education, actually. And sex and, sex and health education doesn't just start at home, at uh, school rather, it starts at home. From the moment a child asks you and points between their legs, what do I call that? Or where do babies come from? You need to normalise the conversation. And it's not just about the words, actually. It's also about the body language. You know, if you're pulling a face every time you change your baby's nappy or they talk to you about, you know, what's between their legs, it's not helpful because you're telling them that there's something embarrassing and shameful there. That moves on. To, so I'm not saying, you know, say the word vulva in the supermarket. What I'm saying is you need to make sure that you're not instilling shame and embarrassment in your children. It's not helpful and it doesn't help them look after or understand their, their bodies. It's a safeguarding issue. You've actually got to think about keeping them, them safe, um, which is interesting when you look at the most recent draft they are draft guidelines that have come out about sex and health education where they're not going to even teach about things that the recommendation is to not even teach about things like fgm until age 14 well fgm happens between the ages of five and seven so if we want to you know make a difference on these things we've really got to make children more aware anyway um so language is important if you don't know your anatomy and people aren't aware of what's going on between their legs and what's going on inside their pelvises. They really struggle to label an anatomical diagram and know what this, you know, when you get your letter about cervical screening, a quite common question is, what's your cervix for? You know, they just, it's just not, not known. If you can't do that and you can't speak easily about these things, then when it comes to you either safeguarding yourself or seeking medical help, 
it's a real problem. People talk about their waterworks when they actually mean their vulva. They talk about down there when they're talking about um, something going on inside their pelvis rather than something going on with their bowels. They get really confused about their tummies and their, their kind of what's different between their digestive you know, anatomy and their, their um, reproductive anatomy. It's a real problem. And we just need to normalise that conversation. You would almost feel that the word vulva is a swear word. You really would. And that's something which, you know, in terms of prevention, we really need. We really, really need to change. If you want to use ridiculous euphemisms, whether it's foo-foo or noona or lady garden, use them with yourselves but also know the proper word it's really very very unhelpful so yeah language really does matter it really does matter i i was on a panel discussion yesterday and heard some terrible uh, statistics so uh, one was that apparently um there's a watershed uh, for 9 p.m where you can say, before 9 p.m you can say penis but you can't say vulva or vagina mm. but also more horrifying mm. was that um that some people may have seen there's a video out where someone was asking young men if a woman's wearing a tampon how does she pee and um someone told me that in brazil there was uh in the big brother house in, in brazil there was a girl who was doing a, mm. a, a a challenge and she had to stand still for hours and hours mm. and she told everyone oh my secret is i'm going to wear a tampon so i don't have to go no. you know, uh, urinate and uh, the, it, did, it did open a huge discussion. And then people started surveying women. And I don't have the, the data. I don't choice. have the data for it. Choice. Yeah. You the, choice. YouGov. YouGov did a survey probably um, four years ago now. And about 20% uh, of women thought they only had two holes. <laughs> and uh, it was high. The percentage of men was, was much higher than that. It was a huge percentage. It was, it was, it was heading towards a third thought that you know just didn't didn't know they had three holes and you know uh, there's a really famous scene in oranges of the new black the um mm. you know the the women's prison uh, american drama where literally uh the, the it's the trans woman it's the trans woman god times were different absolutely no argument about having a trans woman in a women's prison fantastic character totally accepted storyline totally accepted she explains to everybody else that they've got three holes and they all rush off and get mirrors and uh, and there's this kind of it's a fantastic scene because it just shows that, you know, the person who's really engaged with her body is the person who for a range of reasons has had to engage with her body and all these other women really have no idea that is very, very common. People really don't understand their anatomy. That really matters. It really does matter. I mean, you know, there's just been a campaign, I don't know if you saw it, last week by a charity who are called the Lady Garden Foundation. And I totally understand that. It's a great brand. You remember it, et cetera. But they've been highlighting well, what they've been, the, the campaign is to get people to think about vulva cancer. But the whole campaign is based on pictures of beautiful flowers which do, you know, many flowers look a bit like vulvas, don't they? Lots of things look a bit like vulvas in nature. Um, and the whole campaign doesn't use the word vulva when you see the billboards and the adverts. And I totally understand it as a brand building campaign, but it's just such a shame. You know, we need to scream it from the rooftops, you know, and we need to, you know, use it online. And my fear for the, I don't know if this is the case because I don't know enough about how the guidelines the draft guidelines for sex education were, were developed. But it is almost like, so the FGM teaching, it is almost like they don't want to use the word vulva in the classroom. It is almost like that. So just using the word vulva, you know, may be considered inappropriate. But the more you say that, or the more you ban things, then it makes them feel inappropriate. You know, you've got to you've got to be much more open about it and talk about things normally. In my first week at, at um, Beaver Peel, um, I had a supporter contact me because she'd set up her fundraising page. Um, someone who she was raising funds for um, had had vaginal cancer. She had said if she broke her fundraising, she had said on her fundraising page, um, which was online, obviously. Um, 
if I break my target, I'm going to run in a vagina outfit. And the fundraising page put asterisks in, asterisks in oh my God. so that it looked like a swear word. It looked like a swear word. Anyway, I contacted them and they did change that. Anyway. <laughs> no, it, yeah, it's... Language it, it, matters. It's so crazy. It's so crazy. Obviously, I'm doing a lot about reproductive health education. We use the word vulva. I, I, yeah. When I give a talk, I make everyone stand up and shout out, vulva, vulva. You know, it's a great word. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a swear word. And I, I, Well, we could talk about that for hours. But let, let's, let's move on to the gynecological cancers. So on your website, you have some, yeah. some data. So every day in the UK, 58 women and people with gynecological organs are diagnosed with a gynecological cancer and 21 will die. So this is, this is, mm. you know, I, I think, I think it's important to know this and realize that these things, we, you know, we need to discuss this. So let, let's go through them. Yeah. Let's start with, start with um, womb cancer. Um, tell us about mm -hmm. um, how frequent and anything you want to say, uh, prevention, of for womb cancer. Well, womb cancer, womb cancer is the most common of the of the five gynecological cancers, and unfortunately, it's the one that people just haven't heard of. The, the The time that most people have heard of it is when they're sitting in the little white room being diagnosed with it, and that's just not good enough. The other real tragedy with womb cancer is it's very treatable. It's very unlike ovarian cancer, for example. And if you get yourself diagnosed early, you can be treated with surgery usually but you can be treated you know it has a very very good um treatment rate prognosis and very good prognosis um one of the if i could allow people to remember one thing it's no postmenopausal bleed is normal there is no last hurrah period after two years no amount of postmenopausal bleeding should be considered normal and need to be checked out so that's the primary symptom that, that people should be looking for it's mostly diagnosed in postmenopausal women not exclusively and there's a real steady stream of younger women being diagnosed um, um, but that is the primary symptom that I would like to get through, you know, people to, to, to know. And I'd really like to make that um, sign uh, to be checked out, you know, famous. That's the one. It's related to all sorts of things, which, you know, in part, it's really useful for people to know. So it's a very much associated with estrogen in your body. So um, obesity plays a role, but again, not exclusively. So if you're pencil thin and with a very low BMI still if you have a postmenopausal bleed and that's you need to get that checked but that's womb cancer then moving on to ovarian cancer that's a really tough one so a range of symptoms um bloating that doesn't go away and lasts for three weeks or more um changes to urinary and eating habits so getting full much more quickly going to the loo much more frequently um that's a that's a that's something to look out for some people get a little bit of bleeding some people get pain um in their abdomens you have to be very alert to your body and any changes in it and that's what I would like people to, to look out for with ovarian cancer. Really know your family history. Really know whether you've got any first degree relatives who have had ovarian cancer, mother, sister, um, etc. Um, you can now be BRCA tested. So BRCA is the gene which gives you a high risk of developing ovarian cancer. And now if you've got any familial relations with um, uh, someone who has um, uh, BRCA, you you can be tested or who's had in fact who has been diagnosed with ovarian cancer then moving on to cervical cancer now everyone knows the fantastic cervical screening program in the uk um cervical cancer is you know one i would say go and get the vaccine and encourage your children to get the vaccine and if your children missed out on the vaccine because of um the COVID interregnum, you can still take them to the GP to be vaccinated. And there's also a men's vaccination program, which, you know, go and find out about that. There's information on our program on our website. Really effective vaccine, really exciting results coming out globally about cervical cancer prevention um, because of the HPV vaccination. 
The other thing about HPV is it's a real evil genius of a, of a virus. And we're all going to come in, well, not all of us, about 80% of us, though, are going to come into contact with HPV in our, our lifetimes. It's really commonly um, occurring. And it doesn't just cause cervical cancer. There are other cancers it causes. Anal cancer is a high risk factor. Vulval cancer is a high risk ca cancer. Um, the uh, throat and neck cancers is a high risk um, uh, uh, risk factor. So be aware of just how important prevention is, real prevention. So if you prevent HPV, you prevent cancer. That's just it. That's the equation and how it works. Cervical, you know, it's really thinking about, again, your bleeding. So bleeding after sex, um, bleeding in between periods, bleeding that's unusual for you. Same with could be discharge after sex that's a bit bloody, not to be embarrassed about getting help and seeking advice if you see something like that. Painful sex, pain pain and sex shouldn't be normal and if it suddenly happens that really isn't isn't normal those are the main things to look out for and go for your cervical screening it's not easy for everyone there are many groups that have barriers to screening and what things that make it more difficult but go for screening um and you know that's a really really effective program as well you know the nhs screening program then vulval and vagina i mean generally do you check your vulva? I could ask you that. Do you check your vulva? People check their breasts. You know, some they should be checking them once a month, once every six weeks. Be aware of your own body. Feel, look, use a mirror, skin changes, raised patches, anything that looks different to you. Lumps, bumps, bleeding, pain. You know, vulval cancer is a really tough cancer, a really tough one to treat. and. It's just tragic when you then speak to someone who's never looked down there, but had been aware of itching, discomfort, but had never actually been examined by their GP after multiple visits. They have thought it was thrush. They thought it might be lichen sclerosis. They thought it might be various things. They've never actually been examined and they've never looked themselves. The thing with all of these things is, you know, GPs have a difficult job. The clues in the G word, general. They've got to know a lot about a lot. You've got to make things as easy for them as possible. You've got to advocate for your own health so they can advocate properly for you. So you, you know, it doesn't, you know, you don't want to miss something and you don't want them to miss something. And that's all about knowledge and uh, communication. Wow, thank you so much. I'm sure everybody has learned something from that. And, and this, you've given some key indicators of what we should be checking for. Um, that's that's really, really important. And if anyone wants to know more, again, please visit the Eve Appeal wonderful website with much, much more information. And, and in May, the Eve Appeal ran a brilliant campaign called Get Lippy. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, so we're always looking at ways to engage the widest possible audience. And um, one of the things that we wanted to do was really think about um, things that have been done by other health causes and primarily things like, you know, breast cancer awareness and the beauty industry alongside things like Movember and uh, male health, men's health. And, and so we thought long and hard about that and thought, well, we want to really focus on being loud and with their speaking out without embarrassment about these issues. So we want to develop something that fits with that as a term in terms of a tone of voice and a brand. So Get Lippy was the kind of obvious one. And the alignment with beauty and with women's health and women's empowerment seemed like a really obvious one. So it's a campaign that runs every May. We work with a whole range of beauty brands. We didn't want to work with one brand. It needed to be something where brands could stand shoulder to shoulder. We give those brands who donate 10% of a sale of a product during the month. So it's all about raising funds as well as raising awareness. Um, we give them lots of content to share. So you get some very surprising content about vulvas and vaginas on, you know, the Carmex social media channels, for example, um, or Tesco food channel or, you know, it's a, it's great. Um, so that's the whole idea behind Be Get Lippy. It's about working in partnership, collaboratively, cross-sector, 
take it right back to what I said about working with Anita Roddick and the, the body shop. It's about that. It's about putting it all together and saying, we can't solve this, just us. We've got to solve it together. And it also then helps reach a really much wider public audience, which is absolutely critical. Very different people buy Carmex than would naturally go to the Eva Peel website. It, it's a, it's a brilliant campaign, and I love it. That sense of community get get everyone on board. You know, it doesn't matter if they're corporates. You know, whatever. Yeah. Get get. Every, I love that. I, I really love that, Athena. And you've mm-hmm. already mentioned some of the research and how women's health is really under researched. And I and and you did talk about some of the projects that the Eve Appeal has sponsored towards screening, early diagnosis, and risk pre- prevention. Is there any research that's currently yeah. underway that you think's really, you know, exciting? Oh, we've got loads. Um, oh, just loads. So we've just, uh, we've just, um, as I think I mentioned earlier, we've just funded a research fellow in Manchester who's um, who's called uh, Kalechi, uh, a fantastic young researcher and also a clinician who's looking at the early diagnosis of womb cancer and whether that can be done with biomarkers. We funded a piece of work that was led by UCL um, and is now led in partnership with the University of Innsbruck and UCL as as well as other European research partners, which was looking at developing a single screening test across four cancers, so um, cervical, womb, uh, ovarian and, um, and breast cancer. So really trying very hard to, you know, bring in you know, one test that can look for very, you know, various different uh, biomarkers and, you know, other other screening tools. Um, We're funding some really exciting uh, work at Imperial um, around womb cancer detection uh, with the eye knife. We're really interested in new technology. It won't solve everything, but, you know, uh, the eye knife is something that has the potential to give an immediate answer to someone about whether they do or don't have um, womb cancer. Now, that's really important, kind of reducing waiting times and anxiety times from when someone is told it might be cancer to it's not cancer is a really important part of the story. Um, We're just about to start a research programme at Birmingham around um, vulval cancer detection, um, which is really, really exciting because vulval cancer is a very underserved area. And we have got a programme around mucinous ovarian cancer, uh, which is a, you know, all of the all of the gynecological cancers, all five of them, even though they did, all, even though they, you know, fifty eight women today and every day are going to be diagnosed with them. In the time we've been talking, you know, at least ten women will have been diagnosed. They're all defined in terms of research and clinical terms in the UK as rare cancers. Mm. Unbelievable. All of them are defined as rare. Now. You know, it's very important that we fund rare cancers, the gynecological cancers. If you've got a rare subtype of one of those cancers, so the work that we're funding um, in ovarian cancer is in mucinous ovarian cancer, which affects probably 15% of ovarian cancers and mucinous, between 5 and 15%. You know, you feel like you are, no one knows you, no one sees you, no one's funding work in that area. So really important and driving funding into medical research couldn't be more important. We've had Brexit, universities are on their knees. It's really, really tough um, to get funding into research. And we need to be we need to play our part in that and really explain to the public why that's important and how exciting it is. I get really excited about research. Well, things you've told us that they they are hugely exciting and are really making a change. So, so it's 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 brilliant. Um, do you think you have uh, taboos and myths in the area of gynecological cancers? Oh, tons of them. I yeah. Knew. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean. I mean, I think there are there are taboos around the words. There are taboos around the mm. signs and symptoms. People find it hard to talk about bleeding periods abnormal bleeding they find it hard to talk about sex they find it hard to talk about discharge you know it's just there are so many plus you've got an entire feminine hygiene industry that is telling you that you need to smell like roses and 
and oh. you know uh, lavender down there um and uh, you know face masks for your vulva oh. um you've also got a whole range of you've got a whole range of um new tech and ai associated companies and businesses that have set up that are tracking telling people they need to track themselves to within an inch of their lives and making them very anxious whether it's about their egg reserves or their periods some of that is really good information if it makes you more anxious for no reason it's really not good you know so there's there's kind of useful things to know and then there's you know making people anxious without good cause I couldn't agree more. I, um, with all this tech coming in, women's health tech, biz, big business, I call it the wealthy worried well. People who have done online tests yeah. and, um, you know, started, as you said, started using some of these crazy uh, lotions, potions, goodness knows what, you know, supplements. And, and they've, they've just got too much money and they're just, they've just become so, so anxious. It's, it's, it's really crazy. Um, so, yeah. The, I, I always ask people at the end, um, the, my podcast is called Why Didn't Anyone mm. Tell Me This? So have you heard people say mm. in relation to gynecological cancers, why didn't anyone tell me this? And what did they ask? Do you know, it really upsets me and I hear it too often. So, um, you know, people who have been to and, to and fro the doctor who are youngish so they you know when i say i never know what what counts as young anymore but they're not they're not postmenopausal so they don't think that they're going to be affected by a lot of these these diseases they are so upset when they find out about abnormal bleeding and mm. they find out that what they thought was a very bad period or a very unpredictable cycle was actually cancer growing in some part of their their reproductive system and that's got to change and generally speaking i would say someone says i wish i'd known that or i want to, i wish i could have told my younger self this many many times over the course of a month too many times um that for, for comfort you know we've got a lot of work to do joyce we've got a lot of work to be getting on with we <laughs> need to um stop chatting and get working today <laughs> You're on holiday. Um, um, yeah, I, it's it's uh, yeah, education. I mean, I'm with you. Education to me is absolutely vital. You know, we've we've got to get everybody, men and women, understanding their body and what's normal. And you know, you said some great pointers here about you know if postmenopause bleeding and you know getting familiar with our vulva and our vagina and just listening to our body. You know, we've we've our, our um mm. project now at UCL. We've called it in tune. We want women to be in tune with their body, and it's so so important. Mm -hmm. We've got we've got to listen to it. Yeah, but we're going to finish on some yeah. happy questions. Indeed. So you're and you're on holiday at the moment. So what makes you happy, and where is your Quick happy fire. place? Go on. <laughs> Where's your happy place as well? Where, oh, lots of things. Like, lots, lots of things make me happy. My dogs make me really happy, and. uh walking my uh german shorthead pointer in marble hill park and by the river makes me very happy yes by by the river by water is um there's even some papers that have just come out about how they they yeah. lower our heart rate and blood pressure and things are really really good for us mm. and the and the very final mm. question what advice would you give your younger mm. self oh really um uh, life's a marathon not a sprint you can't solve things and don't be frustrated that change takes a long time to happen it's not like food coloring into water is it many steps and you have had a brilliant career in life so far and many many more years because we've got so much more work to do athena <laughs> we can't retire we, we can't have retire indeed yet. <laughs> we have it, great to speak oh it's been an absolute pleasure and um i think it's probably one of the if not the most educational podcast I've ever done. And, and we really need to stress Fantastic. that, you know, women need to understand this stuff. So we're, we're, we're going to get this out there and make sure that everyone understands it. So thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of your lovely holiday, Athena. Thanks for taking the time out. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Pleasure.